right, so let's continue the IPC 144, okay? Uh, I had lots of mix up in uploading. <laughs> like I put your videos in OP244 playlist and I labeled it OP244 by mistake, it was crazy. But I think the links on GitHub is correct. So when you click, so don't go to the playlist on, on YouTube, just click on the, the videos that we have on, the, <coughs> on our uh, repository. So in the, in the subject repository, so oh, where is my, let me just see, where is my screen, display settings. So this has to come at left. Yeah, so. Oh, when we are going to IPC 144. To make sure, I'm gonna go home and go through it and see exactly what is what, but when you go in here, uh, uh, click on these instead of going to the playlist, okay? So, and I, and I wrote over there, recording was a mess. If you recall, we had to stop and go, and I came and helped and I forgot to turn off my microphone, so that was the case. Uh, we're not going to do that, hopefully, this time. All right, so the workshop's going to appear over here. It's going to be workshop one. The, do the, the, uh, the workshop is going to be submittable only from computers in lab. So even if you are doing it on uh, your computers, Make sure you have it on workshop zero, so when you come on matrix, you simply go a poll, you get it on matrix, and then you can just submit it from there. Easy, okay? So make sure you do that, and <clears throat> because I want everybody to come to lab, and if you, can, if you do what you're doing and you complete, you become a lab monitor, lab assistant. Any person who completes the workshop helps people who did not. Okay, so this is how we're going to work in class, and you have to do this. So don't think that your workshop is for you at home. Workshop part two is for you to do it at home on your own. But part one, we have to do it together in class. So uh, let's talk about uh, C language, and at the same time, uh, I'm going to open up the, the uh, subject, and I just lost Okay, forget it, let me just, just lost my money. Shake, <laughs> what happened? Okay, later, doesn't matter, let me just. Uh... How can I say duplicate every teacher? Let me see, right? No. Uh, let me just do this. Identify, give me a second. Identify, it's one, two, and two. So one and two, I have to duplicate one and two. Doesn't give me the right. Anyways. All right, so uh, let me just log in, and we're going to start our first C session today. So we're going to actually take a look at the, the uh, we're going to understand exactly uh, how the compiler works and um, how we're going to deal with all the uh, language. Just the mm, weekly schedule. So, um, at, at any moment when I want to start to work in write code, what I do with Visual Studio is this. So, it, I'm gonna, as I mentioned, I'm going to do this few a few times at the beginning of the class, and then I'm not going to do it anymore because you all know what it is. I'm going to come with a pre-prepared 
project solution uh, created, project and solution created. So I'll start Microsoft Visual Studio, and I create a new project. We go with C++, but don't worry. As I mentioned, uh, C is a subset of C++. If you write code, and your code has extension C, a C++ compiler will compile it as a C code. Okay, so doesn't matter if, if, if it's a C++ compiler, as, so, as long as the extension of your uh, files are .c, then you're good. And that's why I asked all the Windows people on Mac, you actually see the extension, but on uh, and Mac and Linux, but on Windows, it hides the extensions, make sure you disable that so it actually shows the extension so you see what is the type of the thing you are using. So in here, I'm gonna create an empty project for C++, which, is, which we're gonna use for C. <coughs> and then I'm gonna click on Next. You select in your OOP24, uh, IPC144 works repository, I will select I will select our, oh, we don't, uh, wait a minute, so that's home, so now I have to clone it, good. So we're gonna come over here, I'm gonna go in here and clone it because it's the first time I'm using it here. So I'm gonna go SSH and I'm gonna clone, uh, copy, uh, copy the SSH uh, path for it. Then I will go to that directory that is Seneca Seneca 144. Let me just say pin to quick access so we can access it quickly next time. And in here, I'm going to create a directory. I'm going to put 2023. 2231, there you go. And now I'm gonna actually clone it. So I'm gonna say git clone, I'll bring it in. And that's my IPC 144 NVB. Then I'm gonna go in the notes directory and in here I'm gonna create my first project. So, <clears throat> IPC 144 NVB for me is like IPC 144 works for you. Anything I do, I do it in here. I live and breathe in here, and I keep pushing it into the repository so you will have access to anything I do in class. Are we all okay with this? Yes. NBB. That's our section, right? NBB. I hope I didn't <laughs> name it incorrect. It was like NDD, and I put it wrong. It's NBB, right? Yeah, so I'm gonna come over here. So we are, we are in notes. In the notes, this is how I create. So I'm gonna go over here. Now that I have it, I'll go to 2023 NBB. In the notes, in here, I'm gonna say select that folder. And I have to make sure that always this checkbox over here is checked. You see this checkbox? It has to be checked. Reason for it is that we are at very low level of learning right now. Visual Studio, Xcode, and all these in development environments are written to develop massive applications with. It looks like that you are going grocery shopping with a, I don't know, Lamborghini, okay? It's like that, or you are going to pick, I don't know, flowers with an 18 wheeler, something like that. It, it is too powerful what, what we are doing, but there is no problem. We are gonna learn it at this stage, so it's gonna be easier in future. Knowing that, this is designed to have several different projects inside a solution, okay? But for our case, a solution, our project is the same. We're gonna write a loop that prints five numbers. That's not an important thing. So my project and solution are the same. Therefore, I'm gonna tell it, place solution and project in the same directory. I don't have a multi-project thing developing over here. It's just simple. And for you, it's gonna be the same. Always check that checkbox so you don't end up with extra empty directories, nested directories for, for these things. And then right over there, what we are going to do is gonna name what we are working in. So if you are understanding for loop, write that one over there. That's what is the nature of this project, this part of my thing. 
For me, it's today's lecture. Therefore, I put 01, it means first lecture, and I put the date just to refer to it, it's January 17th. Okay, so that's the name of my project. I create the project, and three years later, when the project is created, it gives me a blank canvas to work in. <clears throat> you do not need anything other than Solution Explorer. You can close everything else, property and everything. And even if you close Solution Explorer, it's not the end of the world. Go to View and click on Solution Explorer. And it opens Solution Explorer for you, okay? Then we want to actually start writing code and do stuff. All the things that the folders that you see over here, they do not exist on a hard drive. It's in the mind of your IDE, so IDE organizes it like this. If I actually take a look at the directory that we have over here, as you see, there is nothing in here. The only thing that you have, the, these things are in the mind of your uh, Visual Studio. For your project and the structure and the project and all the things that you have, you only need to carry the directory of your work with the folder of your work with all your source codes in it and two extra files, that's it. Anything else Visual Studio is creating, it's for its own processes. You see there are two files over there. It says 01 January 17.vcxproj and the other one says 01 January 17 VCX Proj filters. Those are the two. The rest, garbage for us. That's why in .git ignore, I'm saying ignore all of them when you are uploading. Solution, SLN that you see, is when you have multiple projects in a solution. It's not a bad idea to have it over there. So you can either double click on the solution or double click on the uh, VCX project only, not the filters, and it's going to open up your project in the last state you left it at. Okay? So those are the only thing you need. The rest of them are all garbage. Now, if I want to add a new item, source files is my friend at the moment. In here, I'm going to create add, and I'm going to say a new item. In here, I'm going to say C++. It is C. We are not doing C++. So I'm going to say prg.c. And that's going to be added in here. Are you okay? That's the code that we are writing. C language is language of functions. C language is language of functions. You have seen in high school, it, you don't need to, don't worry, I'm not going to teach you math. But you remember, you took a little bit of algebra over there. You remember fx is equal to x plus 5. So instead of keep writing the formula, you wrote f something. And that f thingy shows you what the function is supposed to do. Are we all okay with that? You remember that, right? That's all about C language. So C language is a language of functions, which means you do your works in functions. You put the things you want to do in packages, and you ask the computer to use those packages. Because there are so many functions that you are going to create, we're going to create functions that accept stuff from users. Let's say I want to write a program that asks somebody what is their age and then permits them to the bar or not. So what do I need to do? I have to first get user information. So getting user information can be one function. Then I'm going to say examine the age. So we can actually get the age from the user after getting it. So that function receives its job is to get the age from the user and nothing else. It gets it, gives it to us, and now I have the age. I'll give that age to another function that examines to see if this is higher than 19 or not, equal, equal, greater or equal to 19, or, and I'm going to call it examine age. And after that, in my program, if examine age gives me a thumbs up, I'm going to say, welcome to Seneca Bar. If it doesn't give me a thumbs up, I'm going to say, get out of here. You're, you know, you're, 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 uh, you're not allowed to drink. Are we OK? I'm not going to do that now. Don't worry. But because there may be so many different functions that is doing the work, there is one function and only one function that has a unique name that no one is allowed to use. And it's part of C language. C language has only one function 
that nobody allows to use. No, nobody allows to name their functions that, not to use. It, and that is called main. Okay, so the function main is known but by C language. You are not allowed to call your function main. That's all. And let me tell you what the devil is going on. I hate it that I have to jump up and down. I, I like to go talk to students. Up here, I feel like a monkey. <laughs> uh, let me come down. All right, so what happens is that uh, when, how do I put it in words? When you uh, create a program, and you write your C code and stuff, you create functions and all the good stuff. And we say only one function has a specific name that you're not allowed to use. Why the heck this happened? Why did they design such a language? Now, you are at the end line of many attempt to write the perfect language, okay? I'm not saying in any, I don't claim that C is, C is the best language out there. Yes. Yes, it's, it is. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> good job. Good job. Okay. Keep doing that. This is very important. See if it's working. I should actually hang it up here with the light on so we know. <clears throat> so many languages have been created before that they have instructions in them. Using those instructions, you can tell the computer what to do. But um, there came a time that they wanted to, uh, in Bell, actually. Bell. Bell Canada, not Bell Canada, but Bell US, Bell the company, the ginormous company. What they wanted to do, they wanted this language that is, that is so flexible that could run on any small machines, and at the same time, it can run on ginormous machines. And do, so it, they wanted to work with the micro, and then be able to work with the macro too. They could do small little things in the CPU of the, the computer and do little stuff that is extremely what we call low level, close to machine. And at the other side, you want to do ginormous start stuff like organizing networks and, uh, uh, I don't know, switching machines to pass the calls and things like that. So crazy stuff. And no language out there was capable for this. Languages were all, uh, all either made for little shmili googly thingy that you had to work inside the little computer, which was very difficult to write because they couldn't give it bells and whistles. Uh, the computers were so small at the time, with, like they had, and I'm not joking, they had like 2,000 bytes. I'm not talking 20 gigs. I'm not talking 20 million billion bytes. I'm talking 2,000, count, one, two, three, 2,000 bytes of memory. And they had to write a program that runs in there. So their hands were really tight. Those type of languages were very primitive, very close to machine code. And then you said, now write a program that does accounting for you. You know how long would it take? It's as if I told you to build Empire State Building with Legos. You can't do that. For that, you need big chunks of concrete, right? So the building material will be different. So they created C. What is, uh, they created the B language, sorry. Okay? And then they quickly found out what's wrong with it, and they fixed it, and they said, Let's, what do we call the next language? After B comes C. B was for Bell, so they called this one C language. That was the reason, okay? Uh, so in C, C language, what they did, they made the core of the language extremely compact and small. And they, C language is not even capable of printing anything on a screen. In C language, you cannot read anything from keyboard. For that, you actually have to write a function. They said, we write the core of the language small, but we create ginormous library of functions that you can later on add to it if you need it, or just let it be if you don't. So with C, you can do low-level programming with little cutey thingy, like a, I don't know, small panel of a microwave, or you can write ginormous applications that runs websites for banks. It works for both. Because it's just, yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, so that's the thing. So we get there. Nobody knows what is it. When you say Heather, nobody, I always say, what the heck? You're talk, you know, is, is it your friend coming in? You're calling Heather coming? No, so, so I'm not. So no, it, we'll, go, we'll go to that. And so what happened is that, well, because like people, like when you are learning over here, I cannot tell you, okay, it's going to take three weeks for you to write hello on the screen. That's stupid. So they actually created small little libraries for every single thing. Like if you want to do standard input-output stuff, they actually created a library called it standard input-output. And they tell you you can always include that one in your program. So all the functions we have written for you, it's in a place called standard input-output. All you need to do is to say, bring it in. And as of that moment, that small little language that hope I, again, don't quote me on this, but I think it only has 13 instructions. C, I think, has 13 instructions. That's it, one, three. If I can count them, I don't know. It's that small, OK? So you can, these instructions are actually built in into the brain of C. You don't need any libraries to use these, OK? But the rest, they're all in the libraries. We just learn the libraries, and you lose the functions, and it works, OK? So. How do we, what is, okay, when I say syntax, don't get scared. Syntax means grammar, okay? We are just learning a language. But instead of, instead of telling you, okay, ladies and gentlemen, now we're going to learn, I don't know, Arabic, okay? It's not like that. It's not a humongous language. It has only 13 keywords, 13 words in it. So it's, it's a very easy language to learn, okay? But the grammar of this language must be precise. It's not like... English language, then, then, then I gotta say, what's that? And that means, how are you? <laughs> okay, so it's, it's just one thing. It's, you, can't, you don't say, what's up? And that actually means, what is up? Okay, there are no stuff like that. Everything is exact. And as I mentioned, as when I'm teaching you this, when I say a dot and a semicolon, it is a dot and a semicolon. It is not space dot space semicolon. It's not like that. You have to follow it precisely because a dumb, idiot, foolish, dumb as a doorknob thing is reading your code. And that's the computer in front of you, OK? It doesn't understand when you miss a dot. It's going to go, what? There is no dot. I can't do anything. Stop, halt, every everything stops just for one dot. Are we OK with this? All right. They should have put those stairs over here so I don't have to go around. And I'm getting 60 years old. I cannot jump up and down as easily. Anyway, so <clears throat> how do we do that? First of all, uh, when you are talking to the, so the cool thing about C language, like the C, C language altogether, is that you have two different types of talking. OK. You talk to something we call a compiler. OK. First, I want to see, understand the level of my audience. OK. So I want to ask. What is a compiler? No, uh, don't answer me. I want you, and I'm not going to pick on you, don't worry. I just want to know at which level. How many people, including those people who are snacking, how many people actually know what a compiler is? If you believe you have an idea of what it is. OK, so we have to start from scratch. OK. As we talked about it before, all the computer understands is zeros and ones. And I'm not joking. It is zeros and ones. We actually wrote it on a paper thing. Remember 0, 1, 1, 0, and we mentioned that way. So we put eight zeros on one side by side. That's a byte. How, and all these things and how the instruction works. So all that it knows is that. For us to be able to write a talk to it, we have to reduce the English language. To so, to so much simplicity so we can make a computer understand it, OK? Now, this language that is in English can easily be translated into machine code. This subset of English language, we call it a computer language, like JavaScript, like Java, like C, C Sharp, C++, Python, Perl. COBOL, Fortland, PL1, all these are 
different taste of nerds of how we're going to speak in English. Okay? And the one that got stuck very well was C language. And therefore, after that, it has branches. You have JavaScript. The syntax of, of JavaScript is actually from C. You have C sharp. The syntax of C sharp, even the name, is from C. Then you have Java. The syntax of Java is from C. Then you have C++. C++ is actually is C with an additional feature. Just one feature they added, one major feature, they called it C++. That's next semester. Okay? <clears throat> so, so that's what it stuck. So we are going to learn this syntax and give it to a program. That program is kind of like a chicken and the egg. Like you say, which one came first? That program is written partially in C, actually, okay, and in machine language. So that program that is an executable, okay, it's like uh, you write a command to see what is the list of your files on your computer. What is the name of that command? LS, right? And if you install uh, Git Bash on your computer, you can actually do LS on your Windows too, okay? On Windows, is DIR. So that DIR is a command that you're actually running that talks to the operating system, shows you the name of the files in your folder, files and folders. These are the commands that we have. We have this compiler, and you can use that as a command. You can give your language, your C language, to the compiler and tell the compiler to check this spelling and its grammar. I use Grammarly every day because my English sucks, okay? You guys are using it too. Oh, I don't know if you are. If you are not, please use it. Okay. So Grammarly. Grammarly is what you give it some text that you have written, and it tells you, oh, there's misspelling, spelling mistake over here. You, this is not supposed to be a noun. It kind of fixes it for you. Yeah. Yeah, it's like a text editor. Uh, uh, not a text editor. It's a text editor with a spell checker and a grammar checker. A text editor is Nano, that I mentioned to you. Using nano, you can edit. It does nothing but does. But some of them, they do spell checking and stuff. That, they have a compiler in it. So a compiler actually gets your C program and sees if your C program is well enough to be able to be translated into machine language. This process is called compilation. Process of compilation happens in several stages. Stage number one, it checks your spelling. That's number one. Spell number two, it checks your grammar to see if your grammar is perfectly good. Spe uh, and after all these things, step number three comes in. If your spelling and grammar is correct, it checks if the promises made is promises kept. What does I mean? It means you promise there is a function called, uh, what was the three functions we said about getting the thing? Student, get, get, you know, uh, person's age, get age. So if you wrote a function called get age, uh, it, it wants to check to see if actually that function exists. You promise that there is a function called get age that you can actually use. Is it there? So promises made or promises kept. If you said to the compiler that there is a function, is it really there? If all these things are okay, it puts all these translations together and makes an executable out of it. So every single file that you have separately will be translated and kept as machine code. And at the end, there is one program called Linker calls all these things together, and then what you're going to have is your C program running. Are we okay with this? Yes. We'll go through it in detail. So number one is syntax check. Uh, sorry, spelling check. Number two, syntax check. Number three, compiling individual files of your, uh, compiling individual files of your program into machine code. Number five, linker makes sure the promises you made are actually kept, which means the custom functions you claimed, they are there, they are actually there, and puts them together as an executable. After I wrote three programs that you see kind of how everything works, I'll bring up a diagram for you I have. 
so you can actually see it in picture how everything happens. Are we okay down to this point? Shall we write our first program? Okay. <clears throat> Every function in C language can, doesn't have to. See, in mathematics, when you have a function, that function must receive a value and then return a value, right? You have fx is equal to x plus 2. So you have to put 50 in here, and it adds 52 to 50, and it returns 52, right? But in, in C language, it's not only what the, what the function receives from other functions and returns to other functions, but there is an outside world too. So your functions may not receive anything or return anything. Okay, so functions in C, they have four <coughs> points of entry and exit. Okay, two points of entry and exit are from other functions. So one function is called another and gives value to it, and the function returns the value out. And another point of entry and exit is talking with live human being outside of the computer. That's why. So when I'm talking about, re uh, uh, when I'm talking about uh, functions, receiving and uh, returning stuff, uh, you will see exactly what I mean. So when I say, when I say, when I say a function receives or returns, it is functions talking between themselves. Okay, when I say that function receives and returns. But if I tell you this function reads an integer from user, prints something on a screen, it, that's not return or receive. It's just talking with people outside of the world. Okay, it's like you are in a kitchen. In that kitchen, you have two different types of things where you are cooking and mixing the ingredients over there. You get something from some cabinet, you add it to a to meat grinder, and meat grinder do it, it brings the meat out, then you add some salt and pepper, you do all these things, okay? So this is something that is happening inside the, the kitchen. But then an order comes from outside. That's not inside the kitchen. Somebody says, I want, I don't know, shish kebab, or whatever, or I want a steak. It comes in, then the aspects, the functions inside the kitchen starts working. Oven receives a plate, plate gets a steak, steak gets sizzled, all the things happen, and then the kitchen prints a steak out to the restaurant. Okay? It's exactly the same thing. Every machine works like that. Things is happen inside the computer between its parts, but there is an outside world that all these things uh, have effects on. So. <clears throat> The main function in C language is written as follows. What it returns and what it re receives. And I'm going to explain those two words. So blindly, blindly write this when you want to write an empty main function. A function has a return type. Int stands for integers. Who knows what is an integer? Okay, so, so all those people whose hand were down didn't know what integer is, right? Who doesn't know what is an integer? So the rest of you are asleep? Okay, people, <laughs> you don't know what an integer? Oh, well, you know, integer is a whole number. A, a number doesn't have, and thank you, for, I know you know, but it's just volunteering to, to put me out of my misery. But I just want to make sure that, so scalar numbers, and numbers that do not have partials, okay? One, two, three, four, five. These are integers, okay? That's an integer. Done, okay? And then we have other types of numbers. We call those numbers floating points. A floating point number is what we call in algebra a real number. A real number is not a scalar. A real number is a number that's a partial, 2.35. Like pi is a floating point number, 3.1415926, right? So that's the pi, all right? So, uh, w and in computer science, that's all, in, in computers, that's all we have. Done, finished. We have either integers or we have floating points, okay? And 
it's, it's as if you go to a place that they only serve coffee or tea. That's your choice, right? But the only other concern will be how big you want your coffee or tea to be. So with that, the size of the containers change, okay? Int, as you see, is an average size integer. It goes approximately, uh, it, uh, the size of that goes approximately up to 2 to power 31. So 31 times multiply 2 by 2, 2 by itself, that's the size. Pretty big, okay? Um, you got to go read the notes and stuff, and you'll see exactly what is that number. Uh, or uh, it could be twice as much that, 2 to power 32. Uh, we'll, we'll come to that soon, too, okay? So, but, it, but it's an integer. So the main returns an integer. Main is the function operating system looks for when it wants to run your program. That's where everything begins. If you have any other function, you have to call them in main. So this is how everything works. It's as if I'm saying, that's the point of entry. And you open the door, and you see there is a world in there. The door you get into is main, OK? Each function receives something from its brackets. And who doesn't know what is the meaning of void? Void means hollow, empty, nothing, right? Void means nothing. That literally means nothing. I don't want to pass anything to it. So a function can return nothing and receive nothing if you want to, because it's just talking to people, doing something. I don't know. Uh, prints a line, OK? Something like that. So main returns an integer. That brings a question. Who, wh what is it returning? To whom it's returning? By the information I gave you now, you should know where that zero is returned to. You see, I have a return statement. By the way, you saw the very first statement of C language, return. That's one of those 13. OK? Return. Return essentially says this function is returning. And what you return should match what the return type of the function is. So I shouldn't have said over here, return 1.325. It doesn't make sense. Because it's returning an integer, I have to return something that is an integer. And zero is an integer. Who that zero goes back to? Which program executes all the program on your computer? Any program. This is one of those. Operating system. Thank you, yes. <laughs> Operating system. Mac OS is calling that. Your Ubuntu is calling that. Your Windows is calling that. So that goes back to Windows. Why? Because you want to send a message to Windows, how did this program end? Was it successful or not? OK? Or do, do, do I have any message or not? OK? And these messages are usually coded. So when somebody writes an application, they give, it gives a booklet out. And they say, if it returns 392, it means user didn't do this and program crashed. That's usually because it, your main returns when your program is done and final. So usually you, you have a manual that says, if I, if I printed 52, that means the, the disk drive was corrupted. And all the things. So usually between programming, when nothing important happens, they return a zero. And that's what we do all the time. So all you see is this in main. Return zero, return zero, return zero. So either you understood what I said. If not, just memorize that. That's what you do. Are we OK with this? So I can actually compile and run this program. You can, to compile and run in Visual Studio, you can hold the control and press F5. Hold the control and press F5. Magically, it will run the compiler, translate, and run the program. And what did my program do? Nothing. Of course, because I didn't do anything. Did I do it? Did I say do anything in here? No. OK? So what do I want to do in here? I want to say hello. OK? I want to say hello. That's what I want to do. So what I'm going to do first, I need to be able to talk to outside world. 
Therefore, I need to be, be able to do standard input-output stuff, right? For that, there is a compiler command that I am talking to compiler with. This is not part of C language, so you start it in a strange way. You put a hashtag. Hashtag means, hey, compiler, I'm talking to you. Okay? Telling to compiler. Compiler, include, and then inside to uh, less than and greater than thingy, you put the name of what I want, what you want. So that's stdio.h. So I'm going to say, give me all the standard, bring the standard input output header file, and therefore all the functions of standard input output will be introduced to me. One of those functions is called print formatted. Print formatted, or in short, printf. Okay? In printf, you can pass what you want to print on your screen. So in here, I can say printf. Hello, IPC 144 NBB, and three exclamation marks, and a new line. And you end the line, every statement in, in C language ends with a semicolon. I am so used to that when I'm writing a letter, I usually, instead of full stop, I put semicolon because I'm used to it. Okay, so any command you write in C, any this is not a command, by the way. Am I issuing a command here? No, I am calling a function, a function someone else wrote that there are so many things in there. So I haven't even learned anything about C yet. Okay, I'm just saying print, hello, IPC 144 NBB. Now I do control F5. It actually go, brings in standard input output and prints over there, hello, IPC 144 NBB, and that is done. Are we okay with this? But if my point was to say hello, I should have created a function called hello. So what I would do over here, I use my imagination. Anything you put parentheses in front of it, that's a function. So in here, I'm going to say, hello. I want to have a function that when I say hello, it says hello IPC 144. What do I do? With the exact same syntax of main, I create a function. What is that function? It's called hello. Do I give anything to hello? No. Does hello give anything to me? No. So what's inside hello? Just printing a hello. Oh. That's it. OK? So I just wrote a program. I wrote a function of my own called hello. That prints hello. But the compiler is so dumb, then it's going to tell you what the hell is that hello. Because when it's reading hello, hello is at the bottom. It hasn't seen it yet. What does it look like? It looks like I tell you, there is a tutor in Learning Center that's going to help you all with your C programs. You're going to be all happy, right? But when you go over there, the guy is not there. OK? So, or let's change the, the, the story. There is actually, let's assume there is actually a tutor in Learning Center that I'm not telling anything about. What happened then? You don't know he's there, right? And if I told you, go to the tutor, you're going to tell me, what tutor? Because I did not introduce it to you. C language works like that. Any function you want to have, you have to introduce it to it. So I have to go before main, and I should say over there, hey, there is a hello function that doesn't receive anything. And that's it. So this one introduces the hello function to C. So you can use it. That's all. Or I could have actually put the function at the top, because it doesn't matter where it's made. 
if I had the function at top of main, I didn't need to write anything. So <clears throat> I could have had that one at the top. <clears throat> but if I run it, this is how it happens. So the program starts, and that's one of the beauty of IDEs, integrated development environments. You see it's right now arrow on main. It means the execution is on main. It starts from there, comes to the function hello. I called hello. So C checks to see where hello is, finds it, and jumps into it. Goes over there. Let me just bring this over here so you can see the output. Goes over there and does printing. And it comes back to main, and zero is returned to operating system. Done. OK? That's how you write functions. As easy as that. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Look at hello. At left side of hello, line 13, what do you see? Or line 3? What does it say? It says void, right? Because it says void, it means you don't need to return anything. If it was an int, then you had to return something. Got it? So <clears throat> again, remember, functions in C are not like mathematical functions that they need to have a result for other functions. Their job may be just something to show to user, and they are not returning anything back to anyone. And this is the first stage of our work. We're just going to work with this. Uh, the first stage of our functions, yes. Which one? Mm, you didn't get the, f you want me to explain everything from the beginning? Yeah. Okay. So, in your program, you can either do the things that you want to do the way you want to do it, just, just in one function. To print hello, right? If that was the purpose of my program, fine. I don't need to write a function. In main, I'm just going to write a hello. But assume that my function first wants to say hello, then wants to ask for all the marks for the students, and then he wants to add them all up, then he wants to find out what the average is and tell what was the adri av average of the class for the, for the test. So, so many things, right? If that's the case, writing all these things in one thing becomes messy. That's why I divide it into pieces. So I'm going to say that hello thingy has nothing to do with doing the average for the tests. I'm going to take it out just to take the confusion out, make it simple, so I know my program first says hello. So I create a function with a proper name, so the second person comes over there, looks at my program, understand what's going to happen. I selected hello. You could have selected greetings. So this time we're going to call it greetings. OK? So I'm going to write a function. So I'm going to say over here, I'm going to write a function over here called, I'm looking for the end key. Where is the end key? Mm. No? Okay, so I've got to go over here. <clears throat> so I'm going to write a function called greetings. Greetings. Okay? And a function in C is written with parentheses and curly brackets after. Like that. This is how it is. So that's how it is. You write the name of the function, uh, parentheses, open curly bracket, and curly bracket. These are the things that are happening inside the function. OK? Now you have to decide what your greetings receive. Does your greeting receive anything from any other function? No. Its job is just to print something on a screen. So I'm going to write something over here, void. So I'm not getting any, anything to it. And I'm not receiving anything, and I'm not sending anything out. What does the greeting supposed to do? Do a printf for me. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Push the wrong thing. Push the wrong thing. My apologies. There you go. So, so it's just going to do a print for me. And now in my main, I can simply say greetings. And if I want to, I can say goodbye after. So I'm going to write another function over here. Void goodbye. 
and I'm going to say printf. Goodbye, everyone. So when I print this right now, I'm going to say hello and a goodbye. So my program has two things. Any functions you want can write. I, you're not going to write it now. I'm just preparing you for, for what to come in the workshop that we're going to do together. OK? So this is what we are going to do. OK? So you write small function. Yes. I'll come to that. Uh, that's the next thing I wanted to say. So printf, or C language, it's one of the standards of C language. When you put double quotes, you're talking about series of characters. OK? We call that a string. It's a standard. There is no such thing as string in C language. You'll see later on. But the standard of double quotes that we put, we call it a string. Later on, you will see that it is not really a string, but it's something else. But we'll come, we'll come to that. So don't get too attached to it. I'm going to ruin your uh, <laughs> thing later on, halfway through the semester. But yeah, anything you put, we'll put between two double quotes, it's series of characters. So series of char characters, when you are doing the typing, they are readable characters that you're actually doing. OK? They are readable characters. Readable characters are A, B, C, D, A, and all those things. But there are many characters that they do other things rather than actually printing something. OK? Those characters are called escape sequences. Backslash n is one of those. Backslash n means go to new line. If I didn't have that one, this would have happened. Take a look. You see that? Is that? Can you see that thing, or it's too small for you? Back there, can you see? This is, this is visible for everyone? OK. Yeah, so as you see, it didn't go to new line. It's that dumb. You have to actually mention it to go to new line. And there are many things like this. We have backslash n. That means uh, new line. We have backslash t. It means go to the next tab stop. So a tab stop is uh, depending on what the operating system sets it. I think in Windows, it's by standard eight characters. So if I go backslash n in here, and I go backslash n in here, and in here I go backslash t and a backslash t. It means go, ne what? go to next tab position as continue. And if I run this, you will see now <laughs> it starts like that. So these are called escape sequences. And by the way, I don't know if I mentioned this to you or not. My job over here is to teach you how to program. I cannot go to every single detail of the C language. That's your responsibility going through the notes. So those weekly schedule that we have, you click on it, you read it, you come the next day, you ask questions. I'll try to cover as much as I can, but it's never complete. Two possibilities. There are things that I'll tell you that are not in the note. There are things in a note that I did not mention, OK? You have to review what I say, and you have to read. Next day, you have to come with questions, full duplex communication. OK? You have to do this. All right? So this is the basics of functions, how to And as you see, I didn't need to actually introduce those guys, right? So <clears throat> what I'm going to do over here, so I'm going to actually, this is how I actually do it. So in here, I'm going to say <clears throat> a hello.c, OK, with functions. And I'm going to say dot C. And I save it. OK? <clears throat> so and then in here, I'm going to go B. And then I'm going to bring these down to just tell you if the functions are coming after the function that is calling them, then you have to introduce them. How do you do that? I'm lazy. I'm just copying the functions and removing the body. Just put a semicolon at the end. That's the introduction. That's how you introduce the functions. You just put the name of the functions up with the semicolon. That means I'm telling you what it is. They call it prototypes. These are called <clears throat> it's introduction, so function introduction, or in C language, prototype. So it's got to be function 
introduction or in C it is called function goal. In C it is called function prototype. Prototype. Okay? So I save it, and this one I'm going to do again. It's going to be hello with functions with prototypes. And I save it. Okay? So <clears throat> when I actually push these things into the repo, this is what I do. So these are the stuff that I'm writing. You see all this x64 and all these garbage in here? I'm just going to come one, one step up. I right click over here, and I should say tortoise git add and all those stuff, right? But if I'm in tortoise git and I just click commit, I can simply go over here and click on all. It means you add it yourself. I was lazy to do it manually. So I'm adding it, and I'm going to say hello IPC144. Commit and push. And now you have it on the web. So when I actually do it like this, you will see that in notes, you have 01 January 17. And in there, you have everything that we have written. And the only f things that you needed, the rest are ignored. If you want to see which one is what, this is the first thing that I've written. This is the second one. So everything I do is going to go directly on the web. So you have the notes for this. But if it makes if it's if it makes sense for you to record any piece personally or take any pictures personally to do that, you're always free to do so. I already gave you permission. I did, didn't I? I did it in class, I think. Anyways, but yeah. So you you can you can record anything you want. It doesn't. Matter. Are we okay down to this point? Right. <clears throat> so so we know what functions are and how to. Uh, right stuff. And, and I want you to, when I'm, I'm going to mention a few things and I'm going to give you certain buzzwords, new kind of vocabulary for you to, to, to talk with when you're actually uh, talking about C, okay? Uh, that you will see later on, there, there, there will come a time that I'm going to tell you target of, address of, things like that. And I'm going to show you certain type of uh, characters over there. And I ask you to call these characters as such. There are certain characters in any programming language that mean differently when they are placed in a different situation. We'll come to that point, we'll come to it, and when we're there, I'm going to ask you not to use the character's name, but the meaning of it at all times. For example, soon we're going to come to an ampersand. You know, everybody knows what an ampersand is, and sign. Okay? You're going to write an and sign, and I'm going to say, no, no, no. Call it address of even if you don't know what does it mean, okay? And then please continue doing that, and everything's, I guarantee, everything's going to be crystal clear for you. So, next thing is to understand, so th these were functions and stuff, so I'm, uh, well, I'm going to just take it off over here. So in here, I'm going to say, uh, um, oh, I'm going to actually let these, let these functions be. Okay, and I'm going to use it. So I'm going to actually say over here, greetings. So that's the first thing that I'm going to do. Now I'm going to talk about different things. At the beginning of where you have a function, what identifies beginning of a function is an open curly bracket. What identifies where a function ends is closed curly bracket. Are we okay with this? Okay. At the beginning of curly, uh, first curly bracket, you can create what we call variables. Variables are containers that hold numbers. In algebra, we call it x, y, whatever, right? In here, we call it variables because they can hold variables, variable values in it. That's why they're called variables. Variables have types, and we only have two types in CLA, two major category of types. That's it. We have integers, we have floating points, we have scalars, we have real numbers. That's it. 
but for different size, depending how big you want your integer be. You want to just count the number of people in a classroom, or you want to see how many centimeters is from here to sun. If that's the case, then you use different types of integers, okay? But a normal size integer is int that you use, okay? There are so many different types that we have. <clears throat> what are the types of integers that we have? So integer types. The comments that I had in previous ones, I'm going to remove, okay? Because you know now it's a function prototype. We had it in the other one. I'm not going to mention it over here, right? And in here, I'm just going to write the notes about what I have. Hopefully soon I'll be able to use my own keyboard over here and you don't, because uh, I have a broken wrist and I have to use an ergonomic keyboard. So uh, um, that's why you see I keep making mistakes because my fingers are, are used to those white thingy. Anyways, so <clears throat> we have two, diff two, two types of variables. How do you create a variable? This is how you do it. So in this main thingy of mine, variables can be created wherever you have an open curly bracket right after and they are only available where that curly bracket ends so if i put the variable at the beginning of main that variable is only available till the end of main after that is thrown to garbage with whatever it has so now in here i'm going to say integer num okay which means num is an integer it's supposed to hold a number. I could have said integer age, if I wanted to hold someone's age. So variable names can be different. Put meaningful num names for your variables. The language is cryptic enough. Don't make it more cryptic by writing integer x, integer i, integer z, and then hold social insurance number in integer z. Then three years from now, you're going to look at Z and you have no idea what the heck is that. So use proper namings. 30% <clears throat> of your time is used usually, 30% of your time in reality when you are an expert is used to find out what is the logic of your application. 70% of your time, how to name things. Because by naming incorrectly, you're going to ruin your own life and everybody else's who works with you. Writing a code is not important anymore. That was in 60s. Now you must write a code that is maintainable. Everything changes every second. How many updates have you received in your phones and computers? Everything changes, gets fixed, updates, Everybody needs to be able to go and reassess your code over and over. So be descriptive. Don't write your story of your life. If you are writing over their age, AG is enough. Don't write age of a customer that is walking in. Don't do that. Be moderate, halfway through. Don't write big stories of your lives and don't write A. Write something that means something. So I'm going to go back to that num because I want to put something over here. Num. You can actually print a number with, actually in this greeting, I want to have two lines skipped so I can separate it with the code, okay? And also, I like to draw a line up and down, so I'm going to write over here void, line, void, and what my line does is just prints a line so I can separate things. This is one of the good things of writing functions, so I'm going to write over here line void and my line is a printf with just a line Ooh, i'm gonna go like that so i can separate sections for easy for easier uh, uh separation of code and execution so in here i'm gonna say greetings okay and actually after my greetings i'm gonna display a line and before my goodbye, I'm going to display a line, as you see. And in here, I'm going to have my goodbye. And I'm going to write my code. So whatever I write over here for you, and I'm going to go to new line over here, printf, just going to new line. And by the way, 
There is another, if you, if, you, what you want, if you what you want to print is only one single character, standard input output has another function who just prints one character. So if you don't want to put series of things, I can, either you could, just, you could say printf backslash n, or you could simply say put char. Put char, it means one character only. Put char, and I'm going to put over here backslash n. And one character is shown with single quote. Lots of characters, double quote, one character, single quote. So that's what I'm doing. So as you see right now, my program is going to show greetings and goodbye and separate them with a line. So when I run the program, this is what I'm going to have. Oh, I have a build error, the first error of my computer programming. Let's take a look, see what it is. <clears throat> first is a warning, as you see. You see that? It says num unreferenced local variable. It says you created an integer, you dumb what? Why you are not using it? That's number one. But that's only a warning. The other one. What does it say? Syntax are missing semicolon before curly bracket. Remember that semicolon thingy that I told you? If you miss it, everything crashes, voila, OK? I always say, if you write a code and the first, sh run, first shot it runs, go run and buy a Lodo ticket. Never happens in your life, ever, OK? So where was it? I can actually go in here in the error list and double click on it to show me where it is. So, ah, I forgot a semicolon after my printf. That's my semicolon. Now let's run the program again. So my program shows greetings and goodbye, but in a nice way. There you go. Hello, IPC144, align, and align, goodbye. Exactly how I did it in my functions. So I don't have to rewrite things over and over and over. That's a good thing about functions. If I wanted to write a line, I don't have a ginormous thing to write every single time. Write a quick function and call the function any times you want. You can do the same thing 50 times if you want. That's the whole purpose of functions, right? It's like a recipe. You don't teach it every single time how to do a chocolate cake. You just do it once, and you give the paper around. People can make their own chocolate cakes. Are we OK with this? Now, <clears throat> I can actually print a number using printf. That's a good thing. That is what is called print formatted. Printf receives a placeholder and then replaces that placeholder with the contents of the variable you want to print. So in here, I can say actually printf, the number, and I'm going to put a column, and I put percent %d. Percent is what we call a format specifier. So backslash is escape sequence, which means I'm printing a special character, like new line, tab, form feed. Go read. The list of all of it are in your notes. OK? So it does that one. But the percent says this is a placeholder. It is supposed to be replaced but, but, but by something that you put later. So I'm going to say <clears throat> number, and I'm going to go to new line. And then in here, I'm going to say num. So my printf says the number, and then it prints the number. Did I put anything in the number? No. I just create the variable, and I'm printing it. So if I run the program, build errors, really? See, now the compilers are getting so smart that it tells me uninitialized local variable num used. I wanted it to print garbage for you. Darn it. And they made the compiler so smart. If it was five years ago, it would have actually printed it. And what it would print was this. Now I'm going to use the F10 thingy. F10 is for debugging. I write it. So I, I'll, I'll press F10. F10 runs everything. It doesn't even let me run. God damn it. I wanted it to run. So. Now, I'm going to introduce you to first break. Five minutes, go come back. We're going to talk about expressions. Five minutes. I'm going to pause. Please let me know that, uh, to, to resume recording. All right, so now we are resuming. So I wanted to run it in except, but. Um, uh, let me just do something in here. So what I'm going to do is this. Uh, but anyways, so it's because we haven't set it to anything, it's not printing it. But now I'm going to do this. I just want to try and see if I can fool it. So in here, I'm going to say num 
is set to 25. Okay, now, there, is, there are math operators in, in C language, and I want you to understand. The most important one, the most confusing one, is this. Okay? The most important one and the most confusing one is the assignment operator. As you hear, I'm calling it assignment operator. Hello? You're in IPC 144? You're in this class? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yeah, you are in here? Okay, okay. Go ahead. All right. All right, so, uh, well, I didn't know there was a back door. That's why I was shocked. <laughs> Somebody came in. Okay. <clears throat> so that's a very strange thing. In, oh, in math, in math, this is what we do. Let me just uh, open up something. So in math, when you are writing something like this, in math, when you are writing, I don't know, uh, 3 is equal to x plus 5, OK? What is the value of x here? Minus 2, right? Because here, it is not an assignment. It is an equal sign. In math, an equal sign is a scale shows that left and right side of the two things are exactly the same. Therefore, you can do the math. In C language, it doesn't mean that. In C language, this is a wrong thing to write. In C language, assignment means setting. Means setting. It means set the left side to whatever is at right. So it, this is actually a wrong C program. In C, I can write x is equal to 3 plus 5. It doesn't mean that they are equal. It means first do the right-hand side. So an assignment operator in C happens in two steps. And I want you to listen to me carefully. It happens in two steps. Steps, step number one, the right side, regardless, is what is at left side will be calculated. What's happening at right side? 3 plus 5, correct? The value 8 will be calculated and obtained. Then, whatever is at right side would flow into left side. Therefore, the value of left will be 8. It sets it. So x becomes 8 after this. Do we understand? Now, if I write In mathematics, that's a crazy thing to write. Because x goes by x, then 0 is equal to 3. <laughs> that's crazy. But in, in, in computer science, that's a perfectly valid thing. That's actually basis of computer programming. The right side will be calculated. What is the outcome of right side? People, what's going to be the outcome of calculation of the right side? 11, correct? Because we had x as 8 before, now it's 11, correct? Correct? So what happens? x becomes 11. You are actually adding 3 to x. So assignment in computer science is setting. It means set the left one to whatever is at right. That's why two, two variables at left and right could be easily be. And left side must be a settable thing. It must, we call it an L value, a left value. A left value must be a settable thing. You cannot write things like this. It doesn't make sense. At left side must be one thing that you want to set it to something. You cannot have a thing. And this is wrong too. It is 4. It's a literal value. You cannot make 4 11. So remember, 
Assignment in C language means whatever is at left will be set to right. So in here, I'm going to say num is equal to 25, and then I will continue. Are we OK with this? So we run the program. First, it goes to greeting and does whatever greeting does. Now, you can walk through a program using Visual Studio, and, Visual St and, and, and Xcode does the same thing, but I don't know how. I don't know what the key, shortcut keys are. Go to the menu, and you'll see. If you look at the debugging over here, it shows this, actually. See what does it show in here? It says step into, step over, step out. You see that? So I'm stepping over now. So if I run greetings suddenly without going inside, what happens, everything happens that will happen in greeting. Oops, I pressed F11 instead. One more time. So when you run greeting, it runs everything. It says, hello, IPC144. It's got to print a line and go one line extra. Then I am saying, now let me bring my mouse in over num. What do I have in num? 268. Did I set it to 268? No, it's a garbage value. If you just create a variable and don't set it to anything, it will have some random value, whatever it was three years ago in there. It's just a piece of memory with some garbage in it. OK? Now I'm saying set num to 25. And as soon as I do that, num will be 25. Now I'm saying print formatted number, and then in place of here, put a decimal number. A D means integer, OK? Put a number, an integer. Essentially, percent %D is for all integers. Put an integer over there. Which integer? I'm putting the value at right side. So it fills the space of that percent %D with the number that is there, and it prints it. And the outcome of that will be the number 25. Are we good? And then it runs goodbye, which is printing the line and saying goodbye. Are we OK with this? So these are variables. And you can have variables of different kind. I can have a floating point number in here. Now, if I put over here 25.34, and I run the exact same program again, the outcome will still be 25. Because num is incapable of holding partial, top, partial parts. Num is an integer. An integer cannot have partials in it. If, and I told you we have two separate categories. We have integers and real numbers. If I want a real number, I have to have one. And those are floating point one. The average size for a floating point is called a float. So I can simply say it's not like a banana float that you're getting. It's a float. And I'm going to call it over here uh, fnum for a floating point, or floating point num. Now I can say num25, like a human being. And in here, I can say fnum is set to 25.123. And in here, I've said the number. Now I can actually say integer num is, put a comma, and float f num is, and I'm going to put percent %f for the float. And I go to new line. Can you see this back there? And you put the float one over here, f num. So what happens in here would be this. with it's going to actually go through your uh, line one by one. It's going to print integer num is. As soon as it sees percent %d, it picks the value of the first one and puts it right there. And as soon as it gets to the second one, it takes the value of this one and puts it in the second one. Therefore, it's going to say the integer num is 25, and floating num f num is 25.1234. And if I run that program, could have actually done that a little 
like that is better so that goes over there and this one comes over here. and if I run the program now in here you will see that If I run the program, you will see that it's going to print like that. And I want, I want your attention to what you see over there. This is a beautiful example. You see that? What did I put in the FNUM? I put 25.123, correct? What is printed on a screen? 1299999, right? For reasons that I cannot explain, you have to always remember, floating point numbers are never precise. They are precise enough, but for the reason, because it's all zeros or ones, right? There is no partial in a zero and one. They have to somehow simulate it. Because of that, floating point numbers are always kept with a precision. They are not ever, they are not ever in, Put exact. They are close enough. Come on, one, two, nine, 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 nine. It is one, one, two, three, right? One, two, three, nine, nine, nine. Is it, what is it? It is one, two, two, nine, 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 nine. It's one, two, three, right? When you think about it, seriously. But again, remember, they are not precise, okay? So that's that. And uh, yeah. So now I can actually do calculations with this too. I can actually say, for example, uh, num, let me just uh, clear this. The class ends at 20 or 25? 25, okay, we have two more minutes. So you can do calculations. I can actually have uh, different types of integers. So I can have over here integer, uh, I'm gonna call it n2, uh, num, uh, I'm going to put value over here, and I'm going to set that value, say, to 10. You can actually have calculations done. You can say num is set to value plus, say, 32. So all these stuff will, you, can be, you can be doing. It, calculations can be done. So basic arithmetic stuff happen exactly as what it happens in mathematics. So you can do multiplication, division, subtraction, addition. They all happen, okay? exactly as how you do it. So if I do something like this and I run the program, you will see that the value of that one will be 42 because it was 25. Then I added, uh, then I set it up to 10 plus 32. So that 25 is wiped out, gone, overwritten with a new value that is the value that I put in front of it. So all old values of variables can be overwritten. And variables are where we put all the numbers and we do all calculations over it. So that's it. Uh, down to this point, you know what functions are, you know how functions are called, you know what variables are, types of variables. For integers, there are so many of them. So for integers, these are the types, character, short, int, long and long long so sh character is the smallest integer they call it character because the code it's big enough to hold the code of a character in it which is eight bits so the biggest thing you can put in a character is 127 the smaller number you can put over there is minus 127 or you can put in here 0 to 255 if it's an unsigned number. But character is the smallest integer, then short integer is 2 to power 16, or uh, we'll go th through the details later on. Uh, integer is 2 to power 32. Long is 32 or 64, depending on what your computer is. And long, long is 8 bytes, which means it's uh, 8 bytes and 16. Dep again, it makes it bigger and bigger. It's like different sizes of cups. And we have the exact same thing for the floating point number. The smallest one is float. Then you have double. Then you have long double. So lo what did I do? Yeah, long. Double. So long double is actually what it is. And as you see, I am putting these things inside 
inside a slash and a star and a star and a slash. Anything you put between these two, you are telling the compiler, ignore it. It's just a comment. Or if you have only one line, you can put two slashes. So star sla uh, slash star, star slash, anything between the two is ignored by compiler. You can write any gibberish you want. Usually you use that one to write explanation of what your functions do, but that's essentially what it is. It's just a comment. So it's as simple as that. And that was the beginning of everything. I just gave you a taste, and next time in the workshop, I'm going to design something that we're going to do together for the first workshop in the class together. You're going to be sitting on, all the, on the computers programming it. And then I'm going to give you something to do similar at home by yourself. Are we all good? OK, please, for the next week, you are responsible for the next session, you are responsible to read types, calculation, expressions. These three you have to read. Week two, it says. Okay? You go to your IPC 144 NBB weekly schedule. You scroll down. You have your weekly schedule. Click on it, and you read this. So you click on types. You read the types. Simple calculations, expressions. Don't forget about logic. That's mine. Okay? You can read ahead if you want to, but we'll get to it. But in here, it's, there is no talk of functions. That's why I said they are different. I start straight up with functions. Have yourself a beautiful day, and see you later.